I've known Mike for several years, and uh, he'll talk a little bit about this connection that I knew him through the Copperheads. We'll get into that a little bit later. But I have watched over the years how this chapter of Habitat for Humanity has grown in staff, uh, in, in budget, but most importantly in homes built in this community. And it's, it's, a, it's a real testament to Mike and his entire leadership team, many of which are, are whom are here today. So, Mike, you're a Tampa native, right? Gaither High? Sort of, yeah, yeah. What experience happened to you before you were 17 that had a strong influence on your life? That happened to me before I was 17? Yeah. Um, so, uh, while I was in um, high school, I, I grew up over in Tampa, uh, went to Gaither High School, um, go Cowboys. Um, uh, when um, probably the, the number one impact uh, growing up was, well, actually it was twofold. One, I, was, I started to have issues um, from a, uh, a stomach standpoint. Um, so I was later at 26 diagnosed with Crohn's disease. However, when I was 15 was when I started having first symptoms. Um, and as a, uh, as a kid in, in high school, as a teenager, um, uh, you know, it was, it, there were a lot of emotional, mental, physical, uh, physical baggage that came along with having um, these kind of issues that really, at the end of the day, doctors had no idea what was going on with me. So that was, that was a little bit of a challenge, uh, trying to figure that out. Uh, my parents also split when I was 17, so that had a pretty big impact. So um, we're, going, we're, going, we're going deep here, Mike. <laughs> uh, it's not Oprah. Nobody has to cry or anything before we <laughs> but. Yeah, that's, that's a lot to take yeah. between your parents splitting up and this yeah. disease you'll live with. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it wasn't working at a baseball card shop at 13, make believe you were an adult? Oh, that was my first job, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, so my first job was 13 years old. I was getting paid under the table illegally. Um, and uh, uh, I worked at a baseball card shop in Tampa. So that was, it was actually a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. But um, uh, yeah, I, I started working very, very early, and I never stopped since. So since thirteen. Since thirteen, my parents kicked me out of the house. You know, and said, "Get to work." <laughs> and you have. I have. So speaking of baseball, what a good segue, Mike. You went to USF. Went to USF. Go Bulls. Yeah. And played ball there, right? I did not play ball at USF. Played ball at Gator. At Gator. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. What are some of your memories of college at USF when it wasn't quite the USF we know today? I mean, in terms of campus and yeah. everything. All my friends went to Florida State in Florida. Um, I stayed home because my parents split, so I was kind of stuck, you know, staying, um, staying local. Uh, my mom, um, I stayed with my mom. She lived five minutes from USF campus. So, but USF campus at the time was a commuter school. Uh, so, um, uh, no there dorms? Were, there were dorms, but it was, uh, it was typically people that got full rides, you know, uh, were, were recruited to USF. You didn't have a lot of folks from the state that would stay local and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, so USF has, I mean, I don't even recognize it now when I go back on campus there. But, um, uh, you know, staying home and going to USF was probably the best thing I ever did. So I, I think um, when I look back on, on my college time, that was really, um, I think when I first started to recognize this opportunity around leadership um, and getting involved in the community. From, from what I know about you, and you, this could be taken both ways, a fraternity yeah. had a lot to do with the whole velocity of your career. Yeah. So talk a little bit about how that, that fraternity leadership position segued into your first job. Yeah. So. When I was in college, um, I got involved with the college fraternity, um, and uh, typical things you hear about, um, partying, hazing, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I learned really quickly as I was pledging a fraternity, it was nothing that I wanted to do with. And so um, I ended up walking away from it. Um, and there was this opportunity with another college fraternity that was starting on campus at USF. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I think I realized like, okay, I want to be a part of something bigger than me. I want to network. I want to, you know, meet people. I want to meet new friends. Um, and there was this opportunity to kind of craft an organization and almost build it. It was almost kind of like building a small business, you know, in, in college. So um, I ended up recruiting about probably 10 or 12 guys that, that all went to Gaither High School. A couple of them were younger than me. Um, I think one or two were older. 
Uh, and we, had, we ended up recruiting probably about 45 guys on campus to start a brand new national fraternity that was wanting to start there. So, um, and I was the founding president of the group, which was, um, uh, you know, again, my f it was my first time ever doing anything from a leadership standpoint. So I, I really had no idea what I was doing other than um, this other group that I had pledged uh, really kind of pissed me off. And I, I you know, I, I didn't like the whole idea of getting hazed and, and, and being mistreated by people that, you know, called, that called you your friend and that kind of thing. So I, I looked at it as, I think what the driving force behind it was, well, that's fine. We're going to go out and be bigger and better than you guys, and we'll do more in the community. We'll give back more. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have the best parties. We'll, you know, all that stuff, right? So uh, it ended up being the, the best experience in, in college. Teak? Teak, Talk Cap Epsilon. Uh, and then you graduate from USF. Yeah. And you find your way working for the, for the fraternity at a national I, standpoint? I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, criminology was your major? Criminology was my major, so I figured I'd go work with fraternity brothers, you know. Um, I, yeah, I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I, um, I had this opportunity because I helped to start the chapter at USF. Um, the national office, which was based in Indianapolis, got a little bit of a, oh, hey, this guy might be, you know, uh, pretty good at going out and recruiting. So I had this opportunity to go work for the national fraternity. It was a two-year contract. Um, I got to go to places. Uh, I spent time at Berkeley, um, UT in Austin, uh, Maryland in DC, um, UF, uh, uh, all around the country. And I got to spend anywhere from eight to 10 weeks at a time at these um, campuses. So, you know, as a 22, 23 year old, it was an amazing experience um, uh, to, to just kind of see, see the rest of the country and do things and meet friends and really build connections. That was yeah. kind of the, the best part of it all. So we're, now you land your first job in nonprofit, which has kind of served you well in the community you've been in pretty well. <laughs> yeah. And this was um, with Habitat. Correct. In College Station? College Station, Texas. Okay. Yeah, so while I was traveling, I met my ex-wife, and uh, we weren't supposed to talk about that. Though. I didn't bring uh, her up. So um, <laughs> met my met my. I said College Station. <laughs> met my ex-wife. Um, she lived in in Texas. Uh, was a uh, uh, was doing work at Texas A&M. So I ended up moving there. Spent five years in A&M. Got married. Um, worked for Habitat, and that was kind of the the best part that came out of that. Um, it was my. Um, I, I originally signed on to be the volunteer manager, but after a month, I was promoted to director of development and um, started raising money and, and fell in love with the mission of Habitat. Who knew that, fast forward, you know, 20 some years or whatever. Yeah. So you're in College Station. Yep. Uh, that relation doesn't work out. You come back home. Yeah. But not with Habitat, with another very prominent mm -hmm. uh, charity, yeah. nonprofit. Big brothers, big sisters. Talk about that experience. Yeah, so, um, you know, found, found that my marriage wasn't working um, and wanted to be back closer to family um, and uh, family and friends, and so wanted to come back to Tampa. So uh, started to just kind of see what was out there. I knew I wanted to work in the nonprofit sector and, um, and stay in, in that area. Um, came across a position with uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters as their chief development officer. My old boss who hired me is right there. That's Susan Ralston. Um, she, um, uh, they wanted to keep the search local in the beginning, uh, but I had some local ties. So um, the search firm said, well, we'll call you back if things don't work out with anybody else. So things didn't work out with anybody else, so they called me back. And uh, one thing led to another, and I came back to Tampa Bay. So um, uh, it was, you know, just every, the stars aligned with it, and it just kind of worked out well. And there's different ways to raise money, right? There's yeah. the building the deep relationship, developing trust. Mm -hmm. Some other people look at it a little more transactional. Yeah. Um, you know, ask a lot of people. So you, you, you've now gone to the second nonprofit in the development yeah. capacity, and then the opportunity comes in 2014 to come to Habitat yeah. at, the, at that time of Pinellas County, mm -hmm. with a nationwide search, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so my, my wonderful boss, Susan, um, had, had kind of clued me and a few other folks in on the fact that she was going to be retiring. Um, and she did everything she could while I was at Big Brothers Big Sisters to kind of position me to potentially take on that leadership role 
um, as she exited. Um, but then the board had a little bit of a different idea because they started having conversation with the board across the bay about a consolidation of the organization. Um, but that was, you know, that was kind of going on all at the same time that I got some strange phone call from someone at Habitat for Humanity who said, hey, we heard that you worked for a Habitat in Texas and we're looking for a new CEO and we'd like to talk to you about it. And honestly, I don't know if I've ever really had this conversation even with Susan, but when they reached out, I was like, well, this will be great practice because I'm gonna go through this whole search process with big brothers, big sisters. I'm the internal candidate and I'm gonna get this job, right? So I looked at the opportunity with, with Habitat as just practice. I didn't really think I was gonna get that far. I didn't, you know, I really had no idea what to expect. And then things just continued to progress. Um, and through that, it was a nine month search process, by the way, which was painful. Um, but during that whole process, it became pretty clear that the organization at Big Brothers Big Sisters was going to consolidate um, the, the two, the, the two uh, groups. And so uh, I didn't know what my future held. I didn't know if I was gonna be the odd person out or what have you. I also knew that that shield that my, my boss would provide would be gone because I'd be working if I did stay on, I most likely would be working for someone else. So it, again, it was one of those things, it's just strange how um, you just kind of follow a path and just kind of let God lead you at some at, at, at points. And it's amazing how the stars aligned and I ended up at Habitat. As their CEO. CEO. Yeah. Damn, boy, were they fooled. Huh? <laughs> Youngest person on staff when I was hired. I believe it. Yeah. yeah this, and this challenge is right there. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'm just going to jump into a little bit about Habitat. Because I'm, I'm just, Michael, still a little bit of a stunner, but he'll tell you a lot more. So when Michael came on board, there were 19 on staff. They were building about 20 homes a year, which is still a lot more than the average habitat, which is like six or eight. Yeah. And the budget was five million. So if I do the math steps eight years ago, eight years 14, ago. Oh. now the staff is 70. They build 70 homes a year, or will this year, mm -hmm. and the budget's 25 million. Mm -hmm. Now that's transformer yeah and I'll let you say it tell because some people obviously know but mm -hmm. in the, in the world of habitat for humanities nationally mm -hmm. where does Tampa Bay now we, uh, West Pasco like? yeah so there's there are about a thousand habitat affiliates across the country I was telling somebody earlier the habitat model is is uh, it's an affiliate model so each individual affiliate from a business standpoint look at it like it's an um, uh, a um, Franchise, thank you. Um, like a franchise, right? And so we have our own local board of directors, we have a CEO, we have our own staff, we're incorporated locally, um, and we pay basically a franchise fee to use the logo and the brand. So there's about a thousand Habitat affiliates across the country, um, and we are the second largest Habitat affiliate based on new home construction out of the entire country. Which is amazing, out of a thousand. <laughs> and it's in a peninsula. Peninsula on a peninsula. On a peninsula. Yeah. And you knew that when you took the job. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but it didn't, I mean. I know, but land is dear and, and, and more dear now. So let's talk about something you or your team does differently than a lot of Habitat chapters, and that's how you use the Community Reinvestment Act yeah. and the banking community, and there's several prominent bankers in the room yeah. to help build homes, which is really, I think, thrust you so far ahead of everyone else yeah. and the other chapters like don't get it yeah well, you know I think um, when I was hired the board really had two two goals um, one serve more families and become sustainable so as a first-time CEO I didn't know the questions to ask so at my very first board meeting we we had to uh, liquidate some of our mortgages in order to make payroll so whoa so Susan didn't train me too good at, at you know maybe reading the financials in advance um, I didn't know the questions to ask, so it was kind of scary at, at, at one point, but I, it became pretty apparent that our business model that we had in place, although it was working and we were building homes and serving families, there was so much opportunity and so much more needed to be done in order to really establish us in the way that we needed to. So started looking at some different things. And, and again, we, you and I, when we got together last week, talked all about relationships, right? And so one of the first calls I got when I started at Habitat was a gentleman by the name of Brad McMurtry. Uh, he was the founder of US Ameribank. Um, and he was our board chair at Big Brothers Big Sisters years and years ago. And he called and said, Mike, congratulations. By the way, I gotta get with you and talk to you about something. And I was like, oh, here we go. Here comes all the solicitations. New CEO, all the banks wanna call. Um, and so we sat down and we kind of came up with a, a game plan on 
how we could um, uh, partner with them from a Community Reinvestment Act standpoint. They needed to show the government that they are, number one, doing small business lending, which is not what we do, obviously. But then the other piece of that is they needed to show the government that they were doing low-income lending uh, from a residential standpoint. So Habitat provides kind of that low-risk opportunity for them. They buy the mortgage uh, note from us. Um, we do all the work. So we underwrite, we, we write the mortgage, um, we, we close on the home, we get the family prepared for home ownership. Uh, we service the note and we also guarantee the note. And so it's a, basically a low risk way for the banks to be able to get this credit from the, from the government. And then in return, what we're able to do is we're able to fast forward building because we're getting all those funds up front. So I know Jim Kirkpatrick's in here somewhere. Republic Bank? Yeah, uh, Republic Bank's one of our biggest partners. Uh, you know, they buy you know, about 15 mortgage notes a year from us. And every, you know, those dollars, again, they go back into building that very next house. And then, you know, Jim, are we ever late on our mortgage payments? Yeah, so, so we, as long as we're paying and as long as we stay current, then, you know, all's good in the world. But other chapters don't. What's going on there? Uh, you know, when Habitat was started by Linda and Millard Fuller back in the 70s, the idea was that your mortgage payments were your, kind of your revolving fund. It was, you were creating an endowment long term. And I think, I think some Habitat affiliates maybe just struggle with, um, you know, kind of looking at it from a, with a business lens. And I think that's what we've been able to do here. So. And it's made a huge difference. Huge. I mean, the banks, and perhaps credit unions too, I'm not sure, no. um, have to show the federal government that they're mm -hmm. involved in their local community, and you give them this perfect uh, roadmap. I don't know every, if every, everyone here knows what it takes to be chosen to be a homeowner. Yeah. What's involved? I think some people, probably not in this room, think, you know, they give away free houses. Yep. Nothing could be further from the truth. Can you explain the process? Yeah, yeah. So the big, the two big misconceptions are number one, we give away homes. Number two, we serve uh, homeless families. Um, and, oh, and the third is that Jimmy Carter, you know, is our CEO. Um, uh, former President Carter is our, probably our most famous volunteer. And still at 97 years old, swings a hammer with us regularly. So uh, we're, yeah, yeah, we're thankful for everything he's done post-presidency to put Habitat on the map. Um, you know, uh, the, the program is an interesting program because it's, it, it, we really, I, I always like to say that we let the cream of the crop into the program. I mean, these are folks that are wanting to change the trajectory for their families. Uh, they're, they're wanting to build a future and, and, and break the cycle that typically has, you know, hindered them from, from growing um, into all that God's intended. So we see, and, and Jack Shanks is our chief program officer. He's hanging out with me today. Um, he, uh, he sees probably about 300 inquiries a month from from families around the community. Now affordable housing has become such a crisis, right? So he sees all these families that come to us and out of those 300, we probably let about eight to 10 in a month. Um, now um, we, we look at credit, but it doesn't have to be perfect credit. It just, people can't have anything in collections. But if they, if they have reasonably good credit, they have steady employment, um, they fall into the income uh, criteria that we look at. So we serve families between 30 and 80% of the area median income. Um, so for a working uh, family of four, its uh, max is about 59,000. Um, so uh, you know, probably somewhere between 25 and 59,000 a year. Um, so relatively good credit, um, steady employment, uh, have to have a housing need, which right now everybody does because they're all paying absorbent amount for monthly rent. Um, and they're willing to partner with us, we can get them into the program. So the willingness to partner is key because we, uh, all of our families go through a series of 28 homebuyer education classes. Did y'all hear that? 20, it's like going to college. Yeah, it is. It's a curriculum. It's a, there's a syllabus. Um, so, and, and these are typically single parents raising kids, sometimes working two jobs, sometimes in school a little bit as well. Um, so we say, oh yeah, by the way, over the next 12 months, you're going to go through 28 classes. Those classes are really designed to help them become self-sufficient and to own their own home. Um, they also put in um, between 350 and 450 sweat equity hours. So they're out working on Habitat homes, swinging a hammer um, and learning how to build a home and, and working alongside our volunteers. So um, someone um, earlier asked me about our success rate. We've built 742 homes in our community. And out of those 742, we've had six foreclosures in our history. So. Banks would love that, right? I know, I know. <laughs> um, I've had the good fortune to attend several of the uh, ribbon cuttings. I guess you hand the keys. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole 
program with some gifts and the mirrors there and these single parents, some of them with their two or three little kids, different age groups, you know, preschool, maybe junior high, and, you, and you, everybody says a prayer in the house and they walk in and it's a very nice, clean, nice home. And, Beautiful. And they've probably been living in something the slum ward hasn't bothered to repair and charging exorbitant rates. I mean, you're changing lives one home at a time. Yeah, we see health improve significantly when someone moves into a new home. Um, mainly because they're, they're, they're dealing with unresponsive landlords. Not all of them, but, uh, you know, they're a good percentage of them. Um, the homes that we build, though, are, you know, we work really hard to make sure they fit into the character of the neighborhood. Um, they typically are the nicest house on the block. They, they lift up property values. Um, and for a lot of these folks, you know, you mentioned the home dedication ceremony. Um, I, I always look at it, when we hand over that key, that is symbolic of breaking the cycle of poverty for these families. So, um, you know, for the very first time in their life, they have an asset. And so they are building equity through home ownership. And uh, there's still no better way in, in, in today's time um, in, in the United States to build equity than through home ownership. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so impressive. Um, talk a little bit about um, the relation between Valspar Paints, mm -hmm. the Valspar Championship, Copperheads, and Habitat. Yeah, um, so Valspar Paint has been a longtime partner to Habitat for Humanity for about probably 20 years. Um, when, um, and they're the preferred paint vendor for Habitat. Uh, for the longest time, they provided free paint. Every time a home was built in the United States, you know, thousands of them, uh, Valspar would donate the paint for every house. Um, when, uh, when the Valspar Championship, or what is now known as the Valspar Championship, uh, was on life support in, in uh, 2013, um, I got involved with the group that you're involved with, the Copperheads. Uh, uh, we were, what, probably hours from losing the tournament to Puerto Rico. Uh, had no presenting sponsor on the event. I had just started at Habitat, and then Valspar came swooping in and signed on as the presenting sponsor. Um, from, from a selfish standpoint, I was so excited, because I was like, wow. You know, right in our backyard, Valspar is one of the biggest national partners. Um, I think I was, you know, banging on Tracy West's door before she even settled into her office and said, we got to chat. And um, she ended up joining our board right away. Tracy, uh, for those that don't know, is the tournament director. She's been a huge asset uh, for that event and has really taken the Valspar Championship from a place where, you know, again, it was on life support to one of the, you know, most premier, premier events, yeah. uh, not only in Tampa Bay, but I think it rivals all the golf competitions around the country. And we're starting to get better, uh, you know, better uh, players every year and, and returning champions. And, and, and well, and that's the big piece, right? So, um, you know, we're, we're one of the pillar charities. So there's, there's three or four top charities that receive funding through the tournament. Um, you know, we're right up there with, with a couple others. And um, so the tournament usually provides us about $150,000. Uh, but the amount of exposure uh, that we receive um, from our involvement is, is priceless. Um, and the amount of friends we've built through that as well. Um, and that's how you and I connected. Yeah. So. so the Copperheads, you know, actually put on the tournament, hire ProLink Sports to, to run it and build at least a couple of homes a year. Mm -hmm. And it's just so synergistic between the charity and the pain and the tournament and habitat. It's, 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 it's you know, so you think about affordable housing and land values, yeah. thank God for the, for the bank relationships, but how do you manage to build so many homes when there's not that much undeveloped <laughs> land anymore? It's definitely a challenge. Uh, it's our number one challenge is finding property. Um, so, but I, I, you know, I think there's a number of things that we look at. Um, we're starting to get into multifamily. Uh, which is, is pretty exciting. For the longest time, we've done single family home development, which is our sweet spot. We can build, I shouldn't say this, but we can build homes with our eyes closed, right? So <laughs> we've kind of perfected that in a lot of ways. And our team, I, I can't say enough about our team, is, is just absolutely amazing. Our construction team, the, the work that they do to build an amazing home is, and, and, and one that they take pride in, in constructing. Um, we're starting to see the housing stock age uh, pretty significantly. And so there are opportunities for teardowns and that kind of thing. Um, you know, there's, uh, it, it, for us, it's been about being creative and looking for partnerships that help uh, advance our organization. We're, there's a, 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 an organization that's trying to do 10 townhomes on the south side on the 16th Street corridor. 
Um, they're having a hard time getting the project out of the ground, so they've come to Habitat to say, will you partner with us? Um, so, you know, that'll be 10 families we'll be able to serve that wouldn't have been served if it wasn't for a partnership like that. This morning we cut the ribbon on a, on a new facility that um, we have in South St. Pete that um, we've moved in uh, rebuilding together Tampa Bay to share space with us. So um, that collaboration will allow us to do work where as we're building new homes, they're uh, doing rehab work on homes that surround the homes we're doing. Um, so for us, it's really about how do we be more creative in what we're trying to do. We're trying to go less dense um, and, and trying to do some townhome projects. And uh, we have a, a big project that Sean King's taken the lead on from our team that will be 57 uh, townhomes in Largo. Um, we have a proposal in with the city of St. Pete for 44 units in Midtown. I think Mayor Welch might have referenced that last month. Yeah, yeah. So if you, uh, uh, if you want to help Habitat, drop Mayor Welch a line and say, I support Habitat getting that property. Um, he, uh, he's, he's been a, a great advocate for us for 20 years on the Pinellas County Commission. And so we're, we're excited to have him as, as the, the mayor of St. Pete. The, it's a new day in St. Petersburg. Yeah. So talk about transformative news. Mackenzie Scott, <laughs> one of the country's largest philanthropists. Yeah. Gabe, I guess you'll have the number on the tip of your tongue, four and some million to a bunch of ch uh, chapters, mm -hmm. but Pinellas and West Pasco got $11 million. $11 million. Tell me what that's going to do. Well, first off. When you got the news, what was that like? Well, you, well, you, uh, so I knew about it for two months, and I couldn't tell anybody. So that was painful. Um, it, so I, I received a phone call from Mackenzie Scott's team, and uh, they, you know, she had been doing some research around affordable housing, wanted to make a big gift. Her largest cumulative gift so far of all the money she's given out has been for affordable housing and it's been to Habitat. And so I think that that really speaks volumes, right? So she did her research. She looked at 400 Habitat affiliates across the country, narrowed it down to 85, uh, 84 plus the national office. She gave the national office 25 million and then she divvied out others. We got the largest amount in Florida, um, which was 11 million. Um, you know, I, when I received the call, I had to sign a non-disclosure non agreement to even know who the donor was. I started to get, you know, some clues, and, um, but it was, everything was so cryptic. You know, I had to deal with a person through a Gmail account, had to deal, you know, it, 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 was, it, was, it was a very uh, um, uh, fun experience, but also nerve-wracking. Um, uh, but, uh, it, you know, it's kind of one of those things you don't realize um, that it's real until it's actually deposited into the bank. And so that $11 million is going to be game changing for us. Um, you know, a lot of people, the first question people ask me is, hey, that McKenzie money, how many more homes are you going to build? And I really wish it was that simple. Um, you know, the, the, those funds, they're unrestricted. And the idea that she has is that you deploy those funds within a two to three year period. So there's a pretty large amount of pressure on our uh, board, then they put pressure on me, and then my poor staff, I put pressure on them. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of pressure to deploy those funds in an um, impactful way uh, that is going to be kind of a game changer for us. So not only will it ensure that we meet our goals for the next few years, uh, because every single home we're building right now is costing us $30,000 more than it did pre-pandemic. So do the math, Mike. Um, 70 your, homes? Yeah. 30,000? Yeah. So 2 point, you know, 2.1 million, is that right? Of a USF education. <laughs> uh, so 2.1 million um, uh, just to do what we need to do, right? So, um, so some of those funds will be deployed in order to make sure that we stay on track. The, you know, and then, and then it's about, you know, how do we go deeper and wider in the community? And so, uh, but we, we, feel, we feel the pressure to do, to do more. And, it, you know, we also have an obligation. There's, families that are that are really really struggling i met a guy on saturday um not to uh derail here but um i met a guy saturday and it, it was heartbreaking i was walking into walgreens i threw my back out um i was mopping and i my back started hurting so i went to walgreens to get those like little icy hot pack things from my back and as i'm walking in there's a gentleman and he has a little uh, vest on um you know f uh, that I, I guess when folks are you know, um, asking for support from people. They have to wear a vest on the corner. Um, and he had these two twin girls with him that were probably nine years old apiece. And uh, I, I walked past them. They were sitting in front of Walgreens. And, and the girls were so cute. They were wearing these little pink uh, pants and matching shirts. And, 
And, and he was pretty well put together. Like it didn't look like they were homeless, but you could totally tell they were down on their luck. So I go inside, I buy my stuff, and the whole time I'm inside, I'm like, what do I, I gotta get them something, I gotta get them something. So I, I, I came back out and I just started talking to him and I handed him my card and I said, I run Habitat for Humanity. We don't, you know, we're not emergency housing, but call me. Because my first thought was, maybe we can give him a job, you know? Um, we, we're always looking for folks. But then I was like, I handed him some money and I said, go get the girls something to eat. And he was like, I'm you know, so thankful. He's like, um, my, my landlord last month, well, first off, his wife left him, um, uh, just left uh, him and the girls, uh, has no idea where she went. And then the, um, um, uh, the landlord increased their rent over 50%. And he's like, I, have, I had nowhere to go. We had no money built up. My wife took any sort of savings that we did have. Um, and he's like, we, you know, we've been staying at the Salvation Army down the street. And he's like, I need $47 a day in order to stay there with the girls. And, um, and so you know, I gave him the money and he, he was adamant about washing my windows on my car to do something. And I was like, no, 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 don't worry about it. But you know, they were literally just in the parking lot doing that. That's become so common. And it's something that we're seeing all the time. Are these people, he has a steady job. Um, you know, uh, he may only be making nine bucks an hour, but, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing the workforce um, unable to live here and unable to, to, to afford to live here. I know Caprice Edmond, who's on my board, um, is also on the school board. And she'll tell you that the school system is losing teachers and employees because people can't li afford to live here. They're moving to Pasco. They're moving to Hernando. They're moving to Manatee. They're leaving Florida. I've had three employees in the last month leave Florida. One moved to Atlanta. One went to Portland. And one went to uh, Asheville. And you know, when we have people moving to Asheville because it's cheaper than than Florida, we're, we're hitting hitting an issue here. So um, you know, and you pay your staff. You pay your team well. I like to think so. I like to think so. I expect a lot out of them, though. That's Susan's fault. I learned a lot from her. <laughs> We're going to get a little lighter um, now. That was a, that was a very heartwarming story, Mike. Um, Y'all have a national, I guess, the whole national office of Habitats in Atlanta. And, you go up there for conferences, and yeah. they have this great, what is it, tomahawk bear? <laughs> yeah. Tell yeah. me that story. Oh, brother. This is actually really funny. So Ken, Ken Rush, who are, is our COO, uh, he, he and I were up in Atlanta um, a couple years ago. It was before the pandemic. And we went to this Atlanta Braves grill and bar, and it was right on Peachtree. And uh, we, they had this special beer on tap called the Tomahawk. It was Tomahawk Draft or something. So Ken and I got it, and we're like, wow, this is good. And after probably three or four of them a piece, we said, this is really good beer. So the next night we went back and had a couple more. And then uh, a few months later, Ken was going up to, to um, Atlanta. And as he was departing, I said, Ken, he was driving up. So I said, Ken, get a couple cases of that Tomahawk beer and bring it back. He's like, yeah, yeah, I got it. So he comes back to the office the next week and is avoiding me. Mm -hmm. and. The first thing I said to him was, where's my tomahawk beer? And he just kind of like scurried off. So I thought like, oh man, he forgot my tomahawk beer. Like, you know, great, great guy he is, right? So um, he starts to tell me the story that he goes into, the, he goes all over the place, goes to all these stores, can't find the tomahawk beer. And so he goes back to the Braves place and he goes up to the bartender and he said, hey, the tomahawk beer, where do I get that? And the guy started laughing at him and walked away. And so... Ken looks around, he's like, what's going on? So the guy comes back a few minutes later, he's like, you're still here? And Ken goes, yeah, I need to know about this Tomahawk beer. And the guy leans over and he goes, buddy, it's Amberbach. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was this, you know, this, the Braves. Yeah, so the Braves just decided they were gonna kind of, you know, trade, you know, change the name of it to Tomahawk or what have you, so. Amberbach. Yeah, so we always joke about it. Anytime anybody's going up to Atlanta, it's like, grab some of that Tomahawk beer. <laughs> Oh, that's but funny. It, was, um, it definitely tasted better than Amber Buck. <laughs> do you have, and maybe not, but do you have any mulligans you'd like to do, some regrets or do-overs? Hmm. We said we weren't talking about relationships, so. Right. Um, or at least that one. Uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, we all make mistakes, right? But I think if you, if you use if you use those mistakes as learning experiences and learning opportunities, um, and you can grow from them, you know, I think, I, I look back, you know, I'm, uh, at everything I've done in my career, my personal life, I mean, yeah, there were times that I probably mouthed off to a parent or, you know, did some stuff like that or, you know, 
wasn't, didn't say uh, a couple nice things to somebody that cut me off on the road, but I don't think there's anything in my life that I regret. I really, I feel blessed in so many ways. You know, I mentioned I have Crohn's disease. I was diagnosed at 26. That's something I've had to live with and ha learn how to live with. Is there a lesson um, here for our audience from that? From? How, how you adjusted or lived with or ma um, managed? I, I've always looked you keep at, a long schedule. You're out, out early and back late. And yeah, I mean, I, I look at everything in life as, as, a as a challenge, but then also how do you balance everything, right? So I've probably the number one thing that has got me through life is surrounding myself with good people. Um, and, and I learned that early on. When, you know, I mentioned the fraternity thing. When I got involved with the fraternity, for me, um, it was, yeah, it was about building friendships and having some fun, but it was also about those long-term relationships I was able to develop with alums. Um, you know, probably one of my biggest um, uh, mentors in life is a gentleman by the name of Ed Drosty. I met him through my mm -hmm. college fraternity. Um, you know, he's one of the founders of Hooters, right. Splitsville, owns a bunch of hotels. Um, he's, he's been like a dad to me, um, especially over the last probably five to ten years. Um, so, uh, but you know, people like that, Su I mean, the fact that my, I haven't worked for Susan in eight years, uh, even though the five years with her aged me significantly. I mean, the fact that she, you know, came off of her round of golf to come here, you know, uh, you know a lot of, it's, it's all about those relationships, right? So surrounding you, surrounding yourself with people that hold you accountable um, is big. And I started doing this thing um, recently at, at, at Habitat. There's 19 staff members that I meet with for 30 minutes a month one-on-one -on -one. and they're all folks who have self-identified themselves as people that want to grow in the organization in advance and so um, I looked at this as an opportunity that to invest in these folks that maybe not only always have an opportunity to sit down and chat with me um, and the only reason I'm doing that is because people have done that for me mm -hmm. um, and uh, and a lot of people took a chance on me and um, and and hopefully um, you know I can kind of do the same and reciprocate Man, it makes me feel old, though. What are you most proud of? Um, probably two things. My college degree is probably one of my most proud things. First time, you know, first generation college student. Um, did two victory laps. Got a 2.4 GPA, but damn it, I got a college degree. Um, so, um, and, and I had no desire to ever get any sort of further education. Uh, so my college degree is probably one of my most proud things. The other thing is I think just being able to live with and, and handle Crohn's disease in the way that I've been able to. I've, I've used it as almost a, um, as a driving factor between, but behind everything I do. Um, so, um, you know, I, I'm not good with authority um, and I'm not good with being told no. And typically when someone says no to me or says I shouldn't be doing something, I typically do it anyway. So that's kind of what I done, I've done with Crohn's disease. That's a good way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, three individuals. Oh, brother. Living or dead, whom you most admire. <laughs> um, that I most admire. My mother. Um, you know, my, I, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't, you know, be successful in life if my mom um, wasn't constantly on me. Um, so I would, I would say her. Um, I would say Ed. I mentioned Ed earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I've learned a lot from him. He has probably given me some of the hardest advice I've ever received in my life. He's been very, very critical, but I always knew there was love behind that. So um, I, would, I would say him. Um, and then, ooh, gosh. There's just so many people that kind of, I mean, you know, whether it's Susan, whether it's Nancy Reidenauer, who, um, you know, is our, um, our CPA. There's, there's so many people that have had an impact on me that I admire and have taught me so much in life. Perfect. So. you have a favorite song? And if so, why is that your favorite song? I don't know that I have a favorite song, but I, my favorite um, music, I have two favorite musicians, Tupac and Garth Brooks. <laughs> Good, good combination, right? It's pretty diverse. Hey, you know, Tupac gets me fired up before I have to come, you know, do stuff, so. <laughs> you know, last month, the mayor couldn't name a song, but put together a super group of five artists that, yeah. he, that, he, that he admires. Prince was up there, I think. Prince right? was up yeah. there, yeah. yeah. Um, good choice. By the way, these are being recorded today from Chris with Habitat, but in the past, the folks from um, Catalyst recorded and put them up on St. Pete Catalyst. So if you want to go back and look over, not the last 12 years, but probably the last year and a half, yeah. 
in Joe Hamilton St. Because you can see the, the, either the talks or the interviews. We're in, in the next um, five minutes, uh -huh. I'm going to allow y'all to ask questions. We got some weird oh, ones last month. This, oh, there weren't really questions. They were kind of soliloquies about Albert Witted. We don't want to go there at this time. Um, so think of some questions for Mike and Habitat. Um, is there any event, past, present, or potentially future, mm -hmm. you'd love to witness or have witnessed? Mm. I am not Catholic. However, one of the uh, most impressive things I went to, I went to the Jubilee in, in Rome, Italy, in 2000. Um, five million of the Pope's closest friends. Um, that was a pretty amazing thing to experience. Again, not being Catholic, but um, uh, that many people um, descending in one area uh, for one purpose. That was, that was pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I've, been, I've, I've experienced a lot of awesome um, things through, throughout life, but um, that was probably, that's probably the, the biggest. Last two. Are there any goals yet, yet to achieve, like bucket list items? Hmm. And they could be professional or personal. We're not talking about relationships, Mike. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so there is, a, you know, there is that personal piece, right? So, um, yeah, you know, I, I, I definitely I haven't had the, the best of luck when it comes to relationships and family, but that's okay. Um, I, God has a plan, and, and I, I'm a firm believer in that. Um, I think in terms of goals, uh, you know, I signed a, a five-year contract with Habitat, so. Um, uh, you know, the next five years, I have some pretty lofty goals for the organization. Um, uh, there's a lot that I feel like is still left to do at Habitat before I were to leave or move on from there, if I, you know, move on. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I think uh, when I look at the work that Habitat is doing, there's just so much more opportunity when you look at us as a region. And so um, there's currently nine Habitat affiliates in the Tampa Bay region. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about, um, what could be done regionally, um, I'll just kind of leave it at that. That's a big goal. Yeah. yeah. Any life lessons you'd like to share with us? Some takeaways? Um, I, again, I think um, surrounding yourself with people that are going to lift you up and make you a stronger person. Um, actions speak louder than words, but performance doesn't need to speak at all. Um, and, uh, and wake up every morning, put your feet on the floor, and tell yourself how you love your life. Yeah, yeah. I learned right. that last week. We're going to take questions now. Where are we going? No, you're sitting on oh, there. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought we were going somewhere. I tell the group about, you know, you mentioned equity, right? And, you know, obviously prices of, of Homes are increasing extraordinarily in the last yeah. year. So can you talk about how the equity works for those owners and, and, and also, you know, the, the person you had it at your um, event a couple yeah. weeks ago that got up and spoke, um, you know, when you said create wealth. Can you, can you dive into that a little bit more? Yeah. So, um, again, kind of the purpose of Habitat is not only providing a roof, um, you know, for some hardworking families, but it's also that generational equity that's built through home ownership. Um, we do, um, at Habitat, we have an equity share. And so the longer that the family is in the home, the more equity that they are able to tap into and the more equity they've built, and the less Habitat has access to. And so at the end of the 30-year mortgage, they're entitled to 100% of the equity in the home. Um, and uh, that's probably, that equity share is probably new within the last five years. Um, our mortgage docs before that were kind of all over the place, really. And so we've, we've standardized it. Um, but, you know, we've, we have had situations, and I'll give kind of an example. You know, Ken and I received um, a phone call recently from a homeowner that had been in her home for 12 years. Uh, we built her home in North, uh, uh, or in um, uh, Kenwood, historic Kenwood. We built it probably, t yeah, 12 years ago. Uh, she bought it for about $130,000. Now, can you imagine buying a house in Kenwood right now for $130,000? Um, can't even buy a empty lot for that. So um, uh, this home is now worth about a half a million dollars. And so she receives calls all the time, and all of our homeowners do, from investors that are looking to buy their home for cash. Um, she, Habitat did exactly what it was supposed to do for her. 
So she at the time was a single mom with three kids, bought a four bedroom home from us, uh, raised her kids, and now all the kids are out of the house. She doesn't need a four bedroom home anymore. So for her, it's about downsizing. And potentially, you know, I think her desire was to move to a 55 plus neighborhood um, and, and just have like a little one bedroom condo for herself. And so um, she was able, you know, to, to basically clear about $400,000 in, in profit, it built the wealth that we, we talked about. And now she can go buy something, but also have um, you know, equity that she can leave for her kids. So um, you know, the idea is that if the longer the homeowner stays in their home, the more equity they're gonna build, um, and the more their family's gonna benefit generations down the road. Y'all, the mic's passed around. You can just, you can just move it around, yep. Mike, I want to thank you for uh, bringing attention to Republic Bank's uh, commitment to affordable housing, but really point out that that partnership is a direct uh, result of your leadership and all you've done. We don't lend our money out to just anybody, <laughs> and uh, the fact that you've got such a terrific organization, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that, Jim. Other questions? Any other questions? I'll get the mic. <clears throat> right there. I think John's got one. Your best practice, you obviously very successful at this, uh, but others like so they leverage that at all. Yeah, they do. Um, you know, so there's, you know, we have this network of a thousand affiliates across the country. Um, we do have um, opportunities, whether they're national conferences, uh, whether it's a, an intranet kind of setup. Uh, there are ways for us to kind of share best practices. We had a, a, a group of three that just went down to Collier County last week to talk about what we're doing, talk about what they're doing. Um, Collier County, believe it or not, is the largest Habitat affiliate, um, and uh, they've, they're the first to Habitat affiliate, too, so they've been around the longest. Um, and so um, there, there's definitely those opportunities, and really it's just kind of on the, those individual affiliates to, to figure out how to, how to learn. Um, but uh, uh, it is interesting, as we've grown, you know, when I first started at our affiliate, we were tapping into the knowledge of a lot of affiliates and, and trying to learn from a lot of habitats across the country. I would say that that's kind of turned and we, we receive quite a few phone calls now from folks that are asking us how we're doing things. But, um, you know, I think one of the, um, you know, talk about lessons learned, I think we never stop learning. Um, and the moment that we do, we're complacent and, you know, we're not gonna grow. And we've grown every single year, year over year. Um, so in those eight years I've been with the organization, we have grown every single year with the number of families we've served, the revenue, um, and, and even our, our staffing um, uh, has grown. So, um, but that doesn't happen if we don't continue to learn and continue to, to, to change and shift with the, um, you know, with the climate. You have that for community builds I've been a part of. One thing I always took away was how impressed I was with like project managers, little official uh, through their job, but the people that run the project that are need to avoid on site. What is there a certain specific training like traits that you guys teach, or what goes into that? I've always wondered. You know, there are always people that I'm, I'm always super impressed. With, so. Yeah. Well, and thank you for volunteering with that. Um, we, we, we need volunteers every day to keep the mission moving. Um, and about 20% of the home builds. 20% uh, of the work on each house is done through volunteer labor. That's how we, you know, kind of save a few bucks. Um, uh, so when it comes to the staff that lead the crews, um, we can find people all day that can build homes. There's construction folks all, all throughout the community looking for jobs. Um, however, um, it's a special talent to find someone who can build a home, but also engage and interact with a volunteer. And our staff knows that um, there are days um, that you know, we may have you know, some elected officials or we may have you know, a group of CEOs or what have you out on the build, and they know that we may not get anything done. But it's really more about um, the experience and, and helping those elected leaders feel like, man, they got tons of work done today on that house. Um, right, Caprice? <laughs> we did an elected a leader build a couple, a couple months ago. For, we had about two hours we had probably about 30 uh, elected leaders out there. and They did spend a lot of time t chatting, um, but- We um, also had a CEO, right? We did, we, uh, yeah, Brooke, uh, Brooke was part of our CEO build. We had 55 local CEOs that signed on to that. Um, they, they all contributed financially to the home. We raised about $140,000. Um, I know Amy from Nielsen, her CEO was part of it as well. 
Um, and so we, um, you know, we, we built a home pulling together folks that um, are seeing affordable, the affordable housing crisis through the lens of their employees. Um, so, so yeah, it's a lot of training. They, they learn a lot. They learn how to deal with volunteers. Um, you know, how to, how to have patience is, is probably the number one piece and understanding that things are going to be done incorrectly, we're going to fix it and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it really is more about the experience and making sure that people feel that they've contributed and that they can come back and they're welcomed. Um, so, and no experience is necessary. All right. Mike Sutton, thank you very much. Hey, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Fabulous contribution to our community. Keep your uh, eyes out for either the catalyst or the emails from the Noy or the emails we're sending out to the list. For late May, the Scatter Brothers, talking about filmmaking in St. Pete. Y'all have a great month. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.